Thank you. Um, welcome everyone to our um, exciting webinar today, which is called Material Requirements for the Green Transition, uh, which is organized by the European Environment Bureau and is part of the Horizon 2020 project called Locomotion, uh, which my colleague will also explain in a second. Um, my name is Kati Wiese and I'm working on economic transition policies for the European Environment Bureau. Um, which is one of the um, largest umbrella organizations uh, for environmental topics. And we are advocating for transformative and effective policies uh, on the EU level. So why are we here today? Uh, we are here because the European Green Deal aims to make the um, EU's economy more sustainable. And of course, raw materials are a crucial enable uh, for the transition to a climate neutral economy. Um, but it also means that the, this transition is highly resource intensive and relies on critical raw materials such as cobalt or other war earth, um, which demand is also expected to increase both globally but also in, the, in Europe. And at the same time, um, we need also efforts to make the green transition environmentally and socially just. Um, as Vice President Timmerman said himself, the biggest challenge will be not uh, will be to manage the transition in a way that does not deepen social inequalities. And um, today's uh, webinar is focused on what does it mean for the private sector, and that's what we would like to discuss with experts from different sector um, related to material requirements for the green transition and also potential ways forward. In terms of agenda, uh, we will first hear from our different speakers uh, who have all um, more or less uh, 10 minutes each, which will then be followed by a Q&A. Uh, unfortunately, Peter Hendley from the commission had to cancel last minute, um, but yeah, that gives and the other speakers a little bit more time. And the idea is also to have a very um, constructive discussion and dialogue um, yeah, based on mutual respect, attentive listening. Uh, please also note that we will record the session um, during the presentation and we will um, yeah, stop it um, during the Q&A um, to, to create a comfortable space for everyone to discuss. Also, just briefly on the Zoom netiquette, um, please mute yourself while you're not talking. Uh, also, please turn off the video if not needed. Uh, please use the chat box for comments and questions. Uh, it would also be great if you could um, address uh, or say to whom you want to address the question. And for the Q&A later, you can also use the raise your hand function if you would like to speak out. It would be also very interesting to hear from you where you're joining from. So yeah, please use the chat box to tell us the country and the organization you're from. To start with the presentation, we would like to ask you a question. And I will put the link into the chat. And we would like to hear. What comes to your mind when you hear green and just mining? And I'm not sure, but I think you also need to code perhaps. So if you could click on the Slido and answer the question, um, that would be great. Yeah, and also feel free to say, um, from where you're joining us today and which organization you're working for. Maybe I can also quickly share my screen <laughs> to show the result. Um, okay, we have very different words, challenging, difficult, impossible. Um, some focus on what it means for the environment, like to respect the biodiversity, environmental justice, safe operations, standard and good practices, community engagement. 
restoration, and then also some concrete examples. Interesting. I think it's a good start into the discussion today. Um, let me stop sharing. Um, then I would like to invite uh, my colleague Margaret, uh, who is also part of the European Environmental Bureau uh, Economic Transition Cluster, uh, which focuses on policy questions related to beyond GDP and also yeah, how can we transform the economic system to make it work for people and nature. And um, she specifically works on the policy and dissemination side of the project uh, called Locomotion that I mentioned before, um, which she is going to present. So, Margaret, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Cathy. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see everything? Yes. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. So um, I'm here to talk about locomotion. Um, so what is locomotion? Locomotion stands for Low Carbon Society, an enhanced modeling tool for the trans transition to sustainability. It's a Horizon 2020 project, so it's funded by the EU. And we have um, 13 partners. And you can see the logos of the partners on the right hand side. And locomotion is developing scientific models and tools to assess the socioeconomic and environmental impact of different policy options in order to help society make informed decisions about the transition to a sustainable and low carbon future. And so what we mean by society is that this is going to be useful for civil society, but also policymakers, the private sector and industry and researchers and academics. And so locomotion's model called William is going to assess a variety of things including the European Green Deal, the transition to climate neutrality by 2050, but also effects of pandemics and much more. So William, William stands for Within Limit Integrated Assessment Model. Um, it's made up several interrelated modules, including economics and finance, but also energy, environment, climate change, population, population and society. So this also includes gender, inequality, age, etc and also raw materials, which is why we are here today. And so what are we looking at in the raw materials um, model? It looks at the availability of materials needed by the economy and demanded for the development of energy infrastructures. It looks at the evolution of recycling rates. And it also looks at the energy consumption associated with the extraction of minerals estimated. And so what, where are we? Um, at right now in the project. So the project is a four-year project and we're over uh, the two-year benchmark. Um, the modelers are currently very busy integrated, oh, integrating all the sub-modules into one because basically all the models were developed um, separately and now we're going to um, put them all together. And so the first results will be available in the coming months. So this is a very exciting period for us, but um, so where are we going to get the data from today? The data is um, based on results obtained through other integrated assessment models developed by the EU-funded Medeas project on which locomotion is, is built upon and aims to develop. So it um, is now, it's going to be more holistic in the sense that it looks at a bigger variety of um, themes, but it also has a broader geographical scope. And so the diagram you see on the right hand side is the diagram of the Medeas uh, project. And you can already see that it also includes a variety of different modules, but not all the ones that we're going to look at in locomotion. And so what is the link between locomotion materials and the green transition? Because this is why we're here today. Well, to achieve the green transition, um, there is going to be, and there is already an increasing attention on renewable energy and transportation technologies, as these are um, going to play a bigger and bigger role in, in achieving the green transition and the European Green Deal, for example. And so it's expected that these both, um, both of those will be um, increasing the demand for materials. 
And so what is the link between energy and materials? Well, energy is actually necessary uh, to extract, but also process and concentrate materials. And at the same time, materials are required for energy, particularly renewable energy, such as photovoltaic systems. And we're also going to look at transportation, so mobility. And um, here, um, similarly to energy and materials, they're very closely related in the sense that um, electro electric technologies are intended to replace those based on hydrocarbons as they're um, um, conceived as more environmentally friendly and energy efficient, um, but also new transportation technologies are increasingly being associated to a problem of material exhaustion. And so locomotion is trying to look at energy and mobility through, uh, by looking at the quantity of materials, but also the demand for each material compared with the levels of available metrics of reserves and resources. So what do we have right now? And as well as social and environmental justice through the society and population module. And so if we look um, more concretely at what it means, um, material requirements and, and renewable energy, here you have a, uh, an explanation of all the material that is necessary for the construction, but also for the operation of a wind farm. So you can see that, for example, it requires a lot of steel for the construction, but also aluminium. Not only does it, um, is, is it necessary for construction, but also for the operation of the, of the wind farm and, um, and so on. Um, what does the research say in terms of locomotion? What have we looked at for the related to the material requirements and, and energy, renewable energy? Um, our researchers have focused on the green growth narrative. So what is the green growth narrative? It's the narrative based on combining economic growth with an increase in environmental protection. And this is mainly achieved um, through technology. Um, and, they, and, the green, and they've looked at the green growth narrative because it's the, it's the main narrative at the moment. And so there's three different scenarios that they've looked at to see um, what might be effective in achieving the green transition. And so of those three scenarios, there's one in which um, it has 50% of renewable um, energy systems in its electricity mix in 2060. The second one has 70 for 75%, so a 25% increase. And then the third one has 100% of renewable energy systems um, in the electricity mix in 2060. And so what we see in general from the green growth um, scenarios is that it could drive a rematerialization of the economy because renewable energies would require a substantial amount of minerals rel relative to the current estimated levels of reserves and resources. And um, for example, in the green growth narrative or scenario in where they have 100% of renewable energy um, in the electricity mix, the model estimates that the accumulated extraction would demand would surpass the current levels of reserves for several minerals, such as tellurium, indium, tin, silver, and gallium. And most of those are essential for the construction and operation of the photovoltaic solar plant that was presented in the previous slide. And so, what does this mean? Well, this means that it generally questions the um, consistence, but also the viability of the green growth narrative in its ability to achieve the, the green transition. And so what are the risks associated with this? Um, uh, obviously there's the availability of minerals um, as these are essential for achieving the transition. And so um, the lack of availability of those may pro pose problems to the deployment of some renewable energy systems and net alternative technologies, particularly for so solar technologies. And not only does this have um, risks related to availability, but also geopolitical, because um, as the shift from renewables could instead make um, Europe more energy independent, it simply shifts its dependence from imported fossil fuels to imported minerals, which um, will be 
threatening the, the green transition as well. And now that we've said more about electricity and renewable energy, we can talk about uh, mobility because this is also a major part of the locomotion project. project. And so here, similarly to the slide on solar energy, I've um, included all the material requirements for the construction of um, batteries, oh, sorry, in batteries. And so you can see that different batteries require different types of materials and different amounts, but all of them do require uh, a multitude of those. Um, and some of them we will see are um, being threatened by, by the green transition direction we're taking. And so what, the re what does the research say about mobility and minerals? Well, in order to see what is possible and desirable, the researchers in locomotion have designed four scenarios to analyze the link between transport and materials. And so there are EV trends. What does EV trends mean? EV trends is that this is just the current unexpected trends that we're seeing at the moment. The second one is high EV. So high EV is that in 2050, all personal cars, buses, motorcycles will be battery electric vehicles and 80% of heavy vehicles will be hybrids. The third one is e-bike. E-bike is that most personal cars are replaced by two wheeled electric vehicles, but also e-bikes and non-motorized vehicles. And then degrowth is actually the same as the e-bike scenario, but only with a reduced transport demand as well. And so what do the results show us? The results in general show us in the four scenarios that the most critical materials for the transition scenarios will be aluminium, copper, cobalt, lithium, manganese, and nickel. And as we saw in the previous slide, all of these, um, all the batteries require each between half and all of those materials. So what would it mean if um, suddenly these were to be depleted or exhausted? And what um, more generally, what does the research say? The, the research says that the only scenario um, whose trends in mineral requirements do not rise exponentially is degrowth. And so other scenarios which focus on um, the massive replacement of oil fueled individual vehicles to electric ones alone cannot deliver um, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions consistent with what we're what Europe has um, is aiming for and also could result in the scarcity of some key minerals such as lithium. Um, it is also important to note that the model assumes a doubling of the recycling rate for three scenarios include well the EV high scenario, e-bike and degrowth. And so um, it's good the it's good to understand that the, the role of recycling rates, because even if in, in scenarios with a very high increase in recycling rates, the deployment of electric vehicles still has limits. And so for example, in the EV high scenario, um, the, if the recycling rates of copper, lithium and manganese increase to 57%, 30 and 74% from current levels, which are more or less half of what those are, respectively, all the current estimated reserves would already be uh, have been extracted by 2050. So it is actually going to be really hard to um, create and operate those batteries. Um, and it's going to increasingly threaten the green transition that we're aiming for. And But still recycling is essential um, as shown in the degrowth scenario, because in, de in the degrowth scenario, if it has low recycling rates, reserves of copper and manganese would also be depleted by 2050. So it's really essential that we have a degrowth scenario that includes very high levels of recycling rates. And so what is the conclusion of this? The conclusion is that the new energy and mobility technologies required for the green transition um, will require large amounts of materials. And in a business as usual scenario, some of these will be exhausted and there will be shortages so what should be done to prevent this? Um, well, first, it is important to, to really stress the, the, the reduction or the potential of reduction in demand for transport and energy through policymaking. Secondly, it's really important that 
um, we strive for an optimization of the management of mineral resources. So for example, through recycling. And the third is that we need a medium and long-term planning for the green transition with a global assessment perspective that takes into account materials. So not just what is financially possible, but also what is um, materially physical uh, possible and also aspects of social equity, which um, my colleague Diego will talk about in a minute. Um, so here are the references, and it is also important that um, the EV is not part of the research and modeling team. So for technical questions, we can share the academic papers with you. We um, have some of the researchers here today, um, so feel free to ask them questions, but um, if you want to have more information on this, you can have a look at the references. Um, thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen now. There we go. Thanks uh, a lot, Margaret, for this um, great outlook or this like, also extensive outlook of the, of the locomotion research on this topic. Um, yeah, as she, she said, yeah, I also saw already some of our researchers um, here and, and commenting in, in the chat box. So yeah, we can also follow up on that in the, uh, during the Q&A. Um, I would then like to invite my other colleague, uh, Diego Marin, uh, who is uh, our Associate Policy Officer for Environmental Justice. And as Margaret just uh, mentioned, he has recently published a report with Friends of the Earth Europe on uh, green mining um, is a myth, the case for cutting EU resource consumption. And yeah, it's here to present its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Diego. Um, thank you, thank you, Kati. Uh, thank you, all of you, for being here today. Um, I think it's clear that we may have different views on current strategies, uh, but it's still good to have this dialogue and hope to continue the discussions as we go along. Um, as Kati mentioned, I will present the, uh, the report that Maeve and I from Friends of the Earth Europe uh, and our three co-authors la launched back in October. Um, specifically, this report relates to um, Marguerite's uh, first point of the recommendation she made on, on reduction of, of material use um, for energy as, uh, in materials. Yeah? So to begin, I want to first mention that this report, um, despite the name, does not focus on the technological aspects of mining, nor does it focus on how mining can be made less environmentally impactful. Rather, it approaches the concept of green mining not through the lenses of the commission, the states, or the industry, but from an environmental ju environmentally justice and ecological uh, common sense perspective. The use of the term sustainability being the key difference here. So as we know, the world is facing multiple crises with climate pressures increasing and, pl and planetary boundaries being crossed. Just recently, a fifth planetary boundary was crossed, largely unreported in news cycles. Um, these environmental concerns are, of course, in addition to the COVID pandemic, which can be largely attributed to continued urban pressures on the environment. The EEA's briefing on, economic, on growth without economic growth, as well as the eighth environmental action program, called to move to a well-being economic model, and also additionally to the commitment by the Germany's new Minister for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, uh, including their claims to integrate ecological and social, societal dimensions of prosperity into Germany's annual economic reports. These are all examples of the recognition of the need to do things differently. Um, so while we need to have an urgent and ambitious socially fair transition as a response to the environmental and climate crisis, we also need to open the discussion um, on a clear blind spot that we've been noticing. That is the overconsumption of resources and the mining sector's role in this. So this report sums in on metals and metallic minerals, in particular those used for the green um, and digital transition. Achieving EU emissions reduction targets currently encompasses massive increases in the extraction of certain minerals both in Europe and outside of Europe, as, as uh, Marguerite mentioned. This could undermine efforts to prevent our diversity loss and stay within 1.5 um, Celsius targets, as well as recreating global injustices that continue to put pressure on those least responsible in climate change. Uh, change the slide, please. Uh, thank you. So um, first, putting it all into context. So we're looking at 20, 2060 projections for global and EU material consumptions. Um, we can see that rapidly rising global consumption rates will continue to drive the extensive extraction of material resources. So globally, since the 1970s, despite this one only showing uh, 1990, uh, the extraction of materials has tripled. Uh, the United Nations and the OECD both have done research to look at 
uh, projected overall material demand. And projections are following historical trends, current patterns of production and consumption, and excluding consequences of uh, potential policy changes. So if we continue on this path, the OECD projects an almost doubling of global material use, meaning an increase from 89 billion tons in 2017 to 167 billion tons in 2060, an increase of between 44% and 55% per capita. While there are no specific figures for the EU, growth is predicted among all, all countries. Uh, please change slide. So what does this all mean? Well, we can use the material footprint indicator uh, to get an overall good idea of environmental damage caused by final consumption. While it is not perfect, it is a good proxy for environmental impacts. The material uh, footprint measures the total mass of raw materials, so biomass, fossil fuels, uh, metals, and non-metallic minerals that are extracted along the entire supply chain in order to produce final products and services consumed in a country or region. So extraction for final EU consumption and its environmental and social impacts outside of the EU are taken into consideration in this measure. So in the case of the EU, the material footprint is, um, as measured by Eurostat, is 14.5 per tons per capita, which is approximately a double in sustainable and just level, which best available research such as between anywhere between uh, five to 10 tons per capita. As you can see, it has been rising steadily, dropped in the aftermath of the 2008 economic crisis, and ever since has remained relatively stable. Um, however, it's important to note is that this relative stability uh, of consumption is in spite of increased rhetoric on greening the economy and implementing circular economy policies. Next slide, please. So our report, like I mentioned, focuses on metals and metallic minerals uh, in the extraction and their link to consumption rates. So you can see here that in terms of weight, um, metals are the smallest uh, material extraction group, but are predicted to be the fastest growing ma uh, material group with a per capita increase of 63% by 2060. Metals and extraction uh, processing, of course, come with high environmental and social costs. At the moment, the EU's metal uh, footprint is 1.5 tons per capita, 25% uh, higher, uh, higher, uh, higher than the global average. While the EU makes up only 5 to 6% of the world's population, it consumes around 25 to 30% of metals produced globally. Change slides, please. So globally, uh, 1.2 billion of the poorest people uh, currently account for just 1% of the world's consumption, while the 1 billion richest account for 72% of that consumption. Uh, according to the uh, JRC, the environmental impacts of the consumption of an average European citizen are outside the safe operating space for humanity for nearly 40% of impact categories investigated. Of note are the impacts from resource use, where the EU uses between 70% to 97% of the safe operating space available for the whole world, thus leaving around less than 30% 30, 30 at best for the rest of the world. Um, next slide, please. So as demands for metals has been increasing, uh, this has happened as the ore grades of these metals have been decreasing. As a result, there has been a massive increase in generation of mining waste, both in tailings and overburdened waste rock. Mining is the industry that produces the largest uh, amount of waste globally. This picture right here is actually, yesterday was the, uh, the anniversary of the Brumadillo accident, uh, you know, so to connect, uh, to connect it to that. So anyway, um, mining operations will often um, store the waste heaps in large ponds that contain by dam. And if these dams burst, they can cause severe ecological damage and pose threats to surrounding communities. So even when idle, the toxic contents can surround bodies of water and local wildlife. And the increase of tailings has also led to an increase in accidents. Over the past century, the failure rate for tailings dams was more than 100 times higher than that of reservoir and power dams. In the past 10 years, 71% reported cases of tailings failures have been documented around the world, which has collectively split, uh, spilled over 100 billion liters of toxic waste, claimed 482 lives, damaged around 2,100 kilometers of waterways, and caused significant damage to local environments. Next slide, please. So I want to uh, continue to stress this point, though many metals and minerals are needed for the uh, green uh, energy transition technologies, many large mining companies and governments are promoting the concept of green mining by effectively greenwashing the industry and ignoring other sectors. So green technologies are the key driver for only six out of the 30 critical raw materials um, uh, from the 2020 raw material list from the EU. Other materials like copper, iron, and aluminum or those for the green transition use overwhelmingly in construction and other sectors and also use significantly in the military sector. Global military operations continue to be deeply tied to mining sites. 
And, and mining companies tend to uh, conceal or downplay the role uh, the, min the minerals play in the arms trade. It's more likely to see a mining company advertising a wind uh, panel, uh, a wind uh, farm or solar panels uh, tied to their, uh, to their need to produce uh, rather than, of course, um, uh, arms trade or, or nuclear warheads. Uh, next slide, please. So the expansion of the extractive frontiers is continuing around the world. Mining activity is increasing. Uh, in Europe, there are already growing conflicts in Spain, Portugal, Sweden, and Ireland in parallel with an increase in exploration licenses in these countries. For example, 27% uh, of the Republic of Ireland and 25% of Northern Ireland already covered by uh, exploration permits. In Spain, there were more than 2,000 mining applications filed in 2018 alone. In Finland, approximately 11% of the total land area has been reserved for mining exploration. And while in Norway and Sweden have more than 500 and 600 exploration permits, uh, this is particularly uh, 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 creating an issue for the Sami, uh, the, uh, the homeland of the Sami indigenous people. So I will not touch on the specific cases for the sake of time, but I invite you to look into them. Uh, we deliberately chose the cases uh, that have a connection to European companies. Um, and last slide, please. So I, I'll make a, a conclusion slide. Um, so basically the way we're heading is that our fossil fuel based system was built on cheap abundance of fossil fuels and seemingly unlimited mineral resources over the past 100, 200 years. The challenge now is to completely replace the system when fossil fuels are running out and together with nuclear are just no longer viable options. And when mineral resources at the same time are becoming more scarce and mining projects taking a long time to take off, which combined will only drive the mining frenzy into more ecological fragile ecosystems, such as the deep seas, potentially the space and protected areas and harming people along the process. So the solution then becomes obvious. This is what I mean by ecological common sense. We have to reduce our material consumption, which together with energy reductions will bring us back to planetary boundaries. Of course, putting social equity at the forefront. Uh, so firstly, the EU can do this by setting limits on its resource use to actively downsize the production of consumption of our economy. Circular economy policies need material reduction targets, not just monitoring for, uh, in the case of the material, uh, material footprint, for example. The EU must reduce its material footprint by 65% uh, by 2050 from current consumption levels. Likely midterm targets could therefore include 30% reduction by 2030 and 50% reduction by 2040. This can be streamlined across all EU policies, member states, of course, with a fair share targets based on their individual consumption rates. And this can be further broken down into individual material groups uh, based on societal needs. So um, for, while the, the idea of the report was more for the commission and the parliament, uh, uh, we, uh, we do still have some recommendations generally for companies that are important um, when it comes to future mining projects uh, and future mining operations just generally. Um, so first of all, they need to conduct uh, robust and meaningful human rights and environmental due diligence in accordance to the United Nations guiding principles and the OECD guidelines. And throughout the entire due diligence process, meaningful engagement directly with local communities and to ensure the participation in the decision-making process of all activities that may potentially affect them, with a particular focus on respecting their free prior and informed consent, as well as their right to say no to mining projects. So proactive publications of the results of environmental impact studies, their annexes and databases must be a condition for all European companies to establish trade relationships with companies extracting raw materials. This was helped to significantly increase the transparency in environmental licensing processes. In addition, uh, corporations should not start any project or source from it if there are issues regarding the quality of environmental impact studies and, and regarding uh, citizen participation during the EIA process or about the evaluation and the issuance of the environmental impact statement by the environmental authority. So effective environmental due diligence cannot exist if the EIA is weak or if it includes serious failures. The same applies to environmental due diligence if companies do not assume an active role in calling on the states to resolve such failures. So embrace also the independent monitoring uh, and maintain close cooperation with local uh, populations of the territories, not only to find the best possible solutions, but to also avoid undesirable negative effects. Environmental due diligence is not only a substitute um, for environmental impact assessment, either in terms of obtaining a social license or any other tool that contributes to generating a responsible process. 
Due diligence is, is a process and a condition that has to be carried out and maintained without interruption throughout the entire duration of any project and can be lost when any of the constituent elements fail. It's important to also enact the zero tolerance policy within supply chains for violations involving environmental and human rights defenders and investors or upstream companies should integrate independent risk assessment and risk management tools to enable reviews of their exposure to risks. And then collaborate also with stakeholders and potentially impact their rights holders to set up an effective operational level grievance mechanism that is transparent about the number of complaints received and how they are addressed. In addition, economic operators must remediate harm uh, and remove uh, procedural obstacles to judicial review. Um, and one last and two actually last things that I wanna mention is the importance of uh, heading from a linear economy to a circular economy, of course, but also to further even uh, circular society where product design are allowed for your reuse, refurbishing and repair of items rather than their disposal. Um, and um, there's a, in, in the EU, there's a, a great potential for collection, recovery and recycling of metals through uh, uh, urban mining, for example, um, processing of domestic and industrial waste, um, recovering from own electronics, recovering metals from mining waste, landfill mining, but this must always, of course, uh, happen with direct communication uh, with communities affected, as it is not always the case that it is ideal to open up old mines, as they would potentially cause more harm than, than uh, properly treating them. So lastly, economic operations must carry out due diligence throughout the entire value chain and not just the supply chain. Um, so yeah, that's uh, my uh, presentation. I hope I didn't take too much time. Um, so pass it on over to you guys. Thank you. Thanks, um, thanks Diego. Um, thanks a lot. So I feel like we had a good kind of overview of, of some of the data and some of the challenges. Uh, and now we would like to move to some best practices and also initiatives. And I would uh, invite, um, I'd like to invite Dr. Patrick Nadol um, first. He's a senior advisor on exploration resource assessment at the IET Raw Materials and the leader of the task force alternative energy storage and conversion at the European Raw Materials Alliance. And um, Patrick uh, will present today the work done by the EIT Raw Materials and also share some best practice of the mining industry today. Patrick, please. Thank you, Katy. Can you see my screen? Can you see the presentation? Yes, perfectly. Uh, thank you very much. And yes, thank you, Diego. This is, there, there were a lot of very interesting uh, concepts, a lot of very important points you raised there. Um, and I will struggle to, to fit everything into these 10 minutes, but uh, let me try. So a uh, material requirements for the green transition, EIT raw materials and AMA obviously are very much at the European center of, of this topic. And uh, you will all have seen uh, numbers like these ones here, the growing demand for minerals and metals, Diego mentioned it, uh, and also Marguerite, uh, of course, uh, they're essential for the tr transition, so uh, the digital and energy transition, as well as for the circular economy, there are different growth scenarios for different sectors. Here's one example, you can see uh, the growth rates uh, projected here for the energy sector, for example. Uh, up to a factor of 10, for example, for lithium, and then uh, down this table all the way to, to uh, graphite, for example, as well, one of those uh, critical raw materials and cobalt has been mentioned as well already. Um, we've all seen these numbers, uh, and we always talk about recycling. What I want to point out here in this slide is that the current end of life, end of life recycling rate, for example, for lithium uh, is, is around 1%. Uh, so we really uh, need to invest in that, we need to research that, and we need to get better at recycling. And this is very much at the core uh, of what EIT Raw Materials and AMRA are doing uh, as well. And I will get to that in some very specific examples. So at the moment, and today even there was an article in, uh, on, on the BBC News side, uh, semiconductors, again, uh, a hot topic at the moment, they are simply not enough because uh, the producers are lacking the raw materials to, to build them. Uh, magnesium has been a hot topic over the last few months. Uh, nickel, of course, and rare earth elements. So my point here is this is, this is not a, an academic kind of uh, thought. Um, 
process or, or, or experiment. This is really, we're, we're running into problems left, right and center because we don't have enough raw materials already. This is a reality. Uh, and to give you one very specific example coming out of the AMA action plan, uh, by 2030, for example, Europe will need at least eight industrial scale uh, rare earth magnet plants to satisfy Europe's demand for electric vehicles and wind power. And at the moment, we have none. Uh, so I, I think we all can see <laughs> the, the huge gap uh, that we're stepping into there, uh, open, open eyed, it seems. It seems. So, uh, and then there's obviously this. Uh, we actually have increasing production rates around mining around the world. But when you look at uh, Europe, uh, it has been decreasing. And, and there is actually a decreasing trend even from 2019. It has been minus 16 to 2020, minus 19. And uh, the latest number here is almost minus 30%. So there is a, uh, a decreasing trend here that can not be in our interest, quite frankly. And then uh, most recently, obviously, we heard what's happening in Jeddah with the Rio Tinto lithium project. And I'm not, I'm not putting that here on a slide uh, to, um, to open up, um, yeah, this kind of contentious discussion around should that happen or not. It's, it's really just the point I want to make here is that raw materials requirements is a very complex topic. And I know we, we can all agree on that and we all uh, acknowledge that, but it's really at the core here. And, and this is the real difficulty I see. It's highly complex and interconnected. It, it's not enough to just talk about a specific material demand and a specific, a specific commodity. It's, it's important to really uh, come together with all stakeholders. Diego pointed that out, starting at the local communities, but also obviously talking with civil society, the industry, uh, startups, uh, universities, RTOs, and so on, uh, and ETH raw materials and AMA are doing that. So these are obviously topics that have large economic impact, and the information is often incomplete and contradictory. So this is really something where all stakeholders, everyone needs to come together. It's a collective problem and we need collective actions to solve it. And this leads me again to EIT raw materials. Uh, that's, that's pretty much at the core of what we do. It's about talent, people and partners. And we have a lot of activities that we are engaged in, a lot of sector, we work along the entire value chain and we look at education and research and development we foster innovation, we foster entrepreneurship, and we have several uh, large scale initiatives, one of them being the European Raw Materials Alliance. So let me give you some very specific examples uh, of how we foster, for example, innovation through our so-called upscaling projects. Uh, this is a recent example here called Harsh Work. And it's about digital twins and really working on resource efficiency. Again, something that Diego mentioned as well. Uh, and this, this is very critical. We, we really need to get better at what we're doing. Uh, I think we all agree on that. We need to optimize the efficiency uh, and that leads to a safer workplace that leads to obviously cutting costs that leads to uh, cutting down the environmental impact and really can have an effect uh, for this project, for example, not just in mining, but also in processing and in recycling plants. So this is really one of the great examples, one of the projects that we funded that has uh, just, just now finished. Uh, and, and this is what we're funding through our upscaling innovation um, funding scheme. Another example uh, that we're yeah, heavily engaged in. We, we support entrepreneurship and open innovation. Uh, let me show you some numbers here. Uh, over the last few years from 2016 to 2021, uh, we have supported 300 plus startups in that sector to really drive innovation. A again, to, to increase efficiency, to lower the impact, to lower the use of water, uh, energy consumption, and so on, and to really drive things like open innovation and let me give you one very specific example here for that in a open innovation we uh ran an uh, Am sorry aramid innovation challenge last year in 2021 uh so together with aramid 
Uh, it was a group of over 30 uh, startups that applied for it. Uh, and the top three were selected uh, and had to present their solution to Aramid. And uh, the winner of this um, company challenge was Bindex, which is a biological solution for dust control. So very applied on the ground, an environmentally friendly solution to reduce dust. And guess what? That reduces water use. And we're again, increasing efficiency. Uh, and this is not just a cost factor. Obviously this has huge implications on the environmental uh, impact as well. So very much practical solutions on the ground that can be implemented and make a real difference. Uh, another important aspect obviously is education and skilled workforce. And uh, when we talk about raw materials requirements, we need that skilled workforce. We need educated people that can drive the smart uh, innovative solutions. And one of our highlight programs, obviously, uh, is the RAWMAT COP Academy. So Earth Observation can really help with uh, resource efficiency. It can help with measuring environmental impact to monitor, for example, tailing dams. Diego mentioned uh, the Brumadinho uh, tailing dams breach and and so many other things so there are so many applications here and europe with its copernicus uh, satellites has a data source that's freely available to industry and, and everyone essentially and this course really highlights the value uh, that is in uh, inherent in uh, yeah raw, uh, raw materials and copernicus so let me, for the last few slides that I have, uh, move over to the European Raw Materials uh, Alliance that's managed and coordinated by EIT Raw Materials, uh, initiated by the European Commission, DG Grow. Uh, in the last year and a half that this has been running now, just, just over one year uh, exactly, uh, Emma has been running, we already have identified an investment need of 10.9 billion. And we have a so-called investment funnel here. So it's going through different stages where um, investment cases are evaluated on, on all aspects, including environmental aspects. So uh, we currently have 30 plus cases in the last stage. So just before they uh, can be passed on to investors and, and really create impact. And I wanna highlight here that this is not only in primary sourcing of materials. This is very much about recycling, about secondary resources and advanced materials. Uh, so this is again uh, highlighting that this is very much at the key here and this is a, is a very strong building block in our portfolio and in EIT raw materials and AMOS portfolio and it's, it's absolutely crucial that we get this right, not just in Europe but uh, all over the planet to increase also this recycling rates that for many of those critical raw materials that we see are still very low. So it's uh, in the near future, uh, not a practical solution to source everything from recycling, unfortunately. Um, and to come to, an, to a close here with my presentation, I would like to highlight that we have our raw materials summit coming up. So please save the date on the 23rd to 25th, hopefully in person uh, in Berlin in May. Uh, yeah, and I would really uh, like to see you all there and, and have a discussion around this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks a lot. Um, also, thanks for highlighting again um, the, yeah, the need for collective action. And I think this was also a bit the aim uh, of this event today um, to discuss um, together. Uh, and also, yeah, the very interesting insights of the different initiatives that you're driving and you're supporting. I think I at least uh, learned a lot of new things. Um, thanks a lot for that. Um, so last but not least, I would now like to invite uh, our last speaker, uh, it was Dr. Thorsten Point. He's the head of project management of the Battery Passport Initiative at the Global Battery Alliance. And since July 2020, he has been delegated to um, the Global Battery Alliance from BSF, uh, where he serves in corporate technology strategic management. And um, Thorsten will finalize our presentations today by giving an overview of the work done by the Global Battery Alliance and particularly the Battery Passport and how initiatives like these support the green transition. Um, Thorsten, please. 
Thank you very much, Katie, for this uh, friendly introduction. Uh, so first question, can you see my screen? Okay, Margaret is nodding. So um, we've heard from, from Diego and, and Patrick already where the needs are in uh, raw materials to enable a sustainable economy based on electric vehicles, based on renewable power, and uh, today I would like to show you um, maybe the glimpse of a solution which is appearing at the horizon. So we will speak about the battery passport. Before we come to the battery passport, um, let me show you a little bit about how better the Global Battery Alliance was founded. Under the auspices of the World Economic Forum, uh, responsible leaders of the industry and society uh, and government representatives came together looking for principles how to realize a sustainable and responsible industry in the future covering the needs for um, renewable energies and the main driver of this change is certainly uh, the climate change how to get to a um, carbon free economy to deliver on the ideas of the Paris Agreement by measures uh, which are in the productivity of the assets like batteries, or to extend the life if it's not being used in a car. And of course, ensuring circularity. Without circularity, um, Diego and, and Patrick have highlighted that uh, that whole concept won't fly. So therefore circularity is one of the key drivers of our approaches. Um, the other aspect is that's not only the, um, the saving of um, our natural resources, but also this will create an enormous value. So we will create new jobs and uh, we will have economic value created by this transition. Um, but therefore we need to be very clear in what's happening here. We need to understand um, the impact we are generating with all the measures which will be um, put on, into place. And uh, the renewable energy is only the first step. The use of the renewable energy has to be fostered by storage systems such as batteries. The last part uh, of or the big block of what needs to happen is to safeguard human rights, especially as we are talking here about mining operations, um, which must be long term steered into a way to comply with UN sustainability goals. And uh, first and foremost, GBA has committed to eliminate child and forced labor, respecting the rights of local communities, fostering the public health and uh, ensuring the compliance and the governance rules for that. Under the roof of World Economic Forum, now uh, has, we have already collected about 90 organizations joining Global Battery Alliance. Those come about half of it from industry and the other half is pretty equally distributed um, across non-governmental organizations, uh, service firms and public stakeholders who are supporting this program. Now with these ambitions in place, um, we, are, we think about how can we understand the impact? And that's what, why we create this battery passport as one of the leadership program. The battery passport should have three functions supporting the um, sustainable transition. Number one is to gain transparency about the operations in the value chain and have a very clear understanding of the impact. Number two is to compare operations, one versus each other, and to understand where is the level of the best practices. And number three is uh, to track the progress. How does the industry develop over time and achieve the targets being set by um, public consultation and by society in general. The passport itself will be a very technical feature that all stakeholders will receive the information they need for making their own decision. That can range from a consumer who 
understands which product to buy as an electric vehicle um, to contribute to a sustainable uh, consumption or a participant of the industry who has his dashboard and to make choices which materials to use, which companies to collaborate with. And all that must be based on accurate and understandable data where all players are measured according to the same metrics. A battery is not a very simple object, which is just put in place in one place, but consists of very many components. The battery itself, which we are driving in our cars, consists of, of modules, which then relate back to um, raw materials, which are then mined somewhere else in the value chain. And uh, all those materials have different aspects uh, to look at their performance. There must may be environmental issues, there may be societal issues. Of course, all over this uh, ecosystem, the governance will take a very um, crucial role to control the performance. We have chosen two parameters to understand, one a technical and one a societal parameter, which is greenhouse gas footprint of the entire value chain and the issue of child labor to be reported through the value chain. This is um, very often associated with proprietary business information, which needs to be protected. And uh, our stakeholder communities consisting of industry, the civil society with a demand of uh, information and governmental institutions having the legislative power now negotiates, how can we report accurately and openly why protecting the individual um, requirements for proprietary data. In practice, uh, we have chosen the two aspects to report on, which are greenhouse gas and child labor, as I already mentioned. However, for having a comprehensive view, uh, coming back to Diego and, and uh, Patrick's uh, talk, um, there are so many other aspects ranging through pollution by waste, uh, enabling recycled content composition, or uh, looking into the livelihood of local communities. All these parameters will in the end game, in our vision, be represented by a, a battery passport, including the governance parameters and the economic contribution to those. We have started out with a pilot project on greenhouse gas and child labor for the time being. And now, how can we collect this? If we have uh, the idea to build a battery, the materials being produced, that whole value chain starts somewhere with innocent raw materials being somewhere in the ground, which are mostly mined and refined, are converted into materials, and then the physical device of a battery being starts like producing the cells we all know from our electronic devices. These data uh, start being accumulated along this value chain and um, come into the production when the battery doesn't exist. If we want to monitor the battery itself, the physical entity of a battery only exists when it is produced together with an electric vehicle. And at that point, we can assign uh, a name to the battery by an electronic device. That's the moment when the battery passport can be created, but all the information must be transported into the battery passport. The passport then can also be utilized to accompany a battery through the useful life and ensure the proper recycling by giving the information and the trackability to those who are collecting and recycling those batteries. Physically, um, this will, whole story will include all the companies acting in, in the battery value chain. In order to make it happen, first of all, we need to agree on standards, how to report data so that we are able to report accurately in a standardized way comparing apples with apples and oranges with oranges. Each player will report a, an own set of data of sustainability performance harmonized with all the other players. That does, needs to be collected by so-called traceability tools. So a mine 
in South America reports on an electronic system which brings the information to a battery producer who may sit somewhere in uh, Munich or in Stuttgart. The OEM combines the information together with uh, his own information, issues the battery passport, and the battery passport accompanies the car during the use phase and enables the recycling. The key issue here will be interoperability of the system. So we need to agree on content and we need to agree on the technical transport of data. And that's a part we are working on in um, multi-stakeholder fora for the, uh, with the Global Battery Alliance. <clears throat> See, Overall idea is now, if we have the information in the battery passport individually tied to the battery, we can read out the information and collect it and analyze it. That's the part which Global Battery Alliance intends to add in a later stage of the project and thereby provide the appropriate information to governments, to NGOs, to auditors, or to the general public to inform how the batteries are performing and how the overall industry is performing in terms of sustainability. By such a system, we believe to having created with our inputs under our control, with the measuring, the transparency, um, the reporting that we create awareness how sustainable the industry performs, this transparency will change behaviors and in the end may change the state of affairs to generate the impact towards a sustainable and responsible value chain. So <clears throat> in a nutshell, um, we believe that the battery passport will be a key tool to report uh, on sustainability over the entire value chain. And this understanding will drive the change and um, nudge all the participants towards a sustainable behavior. In realizing the battery passport, we see Global Battery Alliance as the institution which pre-competitively brings the actors together who have the change in their hand. And we believe it's really worthwhile to act now on the problems we already foresee the future and join forces to get forward. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot, um, Thorsten. This was also a very interesting and concrete example. Um, and yeah, also looking forward to, to discuss those and, and make the internet connections. Um, before we go to our discussion, um, you should now be able to click on the Slido link because we have one other question. Yes, thanks, Ola. Um, and we would just like to, I think I still see the other one. Ah, yeah. Um, if you know of other corporate initiatives um, that there may be potentially out there and that can tackle some of the challenges we discussed before and um, yeah, lead industry to a, a more just and sustainable transition. So we would be curious. Um, to hear uh, about this. Maybe I can give you one minute. And we can also come back to this um, later. Um, we had some um, questions already uh, in the chat box. Um, and yeah, first of all, I would also um, like to thank all the speakers again <laughs> uh, for, for the interesting inputs. Um, I think there were some questions um, um, directed to uh, one or the other presenters. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about it in, in Diego's um, during Diego's presentation, but one of the 